So welcome to this meetup presentation about value stream identification. And my name is Carl and I'll be leading you through this for about something like two hours. And that's why we have a break in the middle so your brain can actually recuperate a little bit. And the talk here is lessons from the wild. It's basically me doing a lot of mistakes around value stream identification and wanting to share those so you can, don't have to repeat those mistakes. That's the idea. And we'll be doing three big things today. One is to talk about the theory, the underlying ideas behind seeing value and working with it and organizing around it. And the second big thing is to have coffee. We won't have coffee per se. I think it's wine and wraps, right? But it's, yeah. it's still a, co it's a coffee break without coffee. And that's like in maybe 40, 50 minutes. And then we'll dive into a practical case, just a very small lightweight where we'll do some option together. We'll explore it and see how we can solve it at each table. We'll be reading some articles. We'll be solving some problems during the evening. But before we start then, just want to briefly touch on the concept of a value stream. Just kind of aligning around what are we actually talking about here. And when I visit an organization to talk about value streams or value creation, I often encounter this visualization of the organization, which is not a bad one. It's just the more common dogma for how we see an organization being organized. This is the traditional org chart with reporting lines, responsibilities. We might have divisions. We might have units. We have someone who reports to someone who reports to someone. There's nothing wrong with this view of the organization. It's a very internal view of how we see ourselves, maybe. But the question I ask when I visit the organization is a different one. I instead ask, so who are we serving? Who are we working for? Meaning, not necessarily a shareholder. I might be rather the people that we give something to, our customers, basically. So what do they get from us? What do we supply them with? And then someone will point out that, well, we're the, we're the government agency that allows you to do X, uh, maybe have your tax return, or we're the, we're the uh, company that provides a self-driving car that allows you to go from point A to point B smoothly. That's the value we deliver to our customers. And then I go, that's an interesting one, uh, so that, that car you mentioned. So who is involved in creating that car? Who's involved in building it, developing it? And then suddenly I ask and I get some insights and I go like, oh, that team is there and there's someone from that area. And yes, the testers from that business unit is there. So I draw a shape around the people involved and I get a kidney. It's not always a kidney, to be honest. It's, it's more often than not something else, but it is always orthogonal to the org chart. I've never seen it go perfectly like, yeah, that one. It's always more spread out and it seems to be a huge mix of competencies and, and experiences and departments involved in creating that value. And this then has a flow to it. It often has a sequence. In one end, there's someone who is supplying the value, basically delivering it to someone that can consume it. And in one end, there's someone who undersees the trigger for a new feature for that self-driving car or sees a tweak to a service that we're providing. And this continuum is often a long-lived thing in an organization. And I would then say that this is probably something that could be called a stream of value or a value stream that moves from a trigger point to value delivery and is repeatable. So I go, what I do is I go dig. This is more like archaeology. I'm trying to learn how to see value moving in the organization. So we call it the value stream, and it always moves through a sequence of activities to a point where someone gets the end value that we're delivering. So learning to see this is hard. We're not used to talking about it. We talk about what unit we work for, what business unit. I'm a tester. I work in the testing department. I'm in project X. I do this project for six months. But then what's the value chain behind it? What's the value stream is the question I shift to. And this is what we're going to explore tonight. And specifically, I want to call out two different things also. Anyone ever heard the word value stream mapping? Yep, most of the room. Cool. Good. We're not talking about that tonight because these are two different things. We're going to talk about value stream identification. Value stream mapping 
is a very useful, very powerful tool. And this is about enabling you to see how value moves in an established value stream. When you've seen it, when you've identified it, you can then go, where's the waiting times? Where's the bottlenecks? How much inventory is there? How many queues? Now you can see how it behaves. And then optimizing it for throughput is that work. What we're going to talk about tonight is this, not that. Meaning that first, in order to optimize, we need to learn how to see first. You can't map what you can't see. And the trick here is that if I go into a manufacturing company today that has a, well, not developing things, making sure that you have enough duplicates of something, often there's a traditional manufacturing line going from one door to another door. In one end, raw materials comes in. In one end, some kind of product comes out. And if I go into that factory and ask, where's the value stream? Almost, I guarantee everyone is going to point to that conveyor belt and say, there it goes. From there to there. But imagine me going into a government agency, a, a service providing company, and I ask, where's the value stream? And the only thing you see is paper and people fiddling with computers. People go, is it me? Is it, is it you? Is it, is it the testers? It, it's much more diffused. It's harder to see. <laughs> So you need to start with identifying. In a service or product de developing organization, value streams are much more harder to see, much more hidden. So you need to uncover them. And that's the work we're going to do tonight. And before we start, let's do a quick warm up to get our social muscles warmed up. And this is why you can't be alone at the table. You have to shift table now. Otherwise, you can't do this exercise. So what I want you to do at your tables is to take a paper, do this, just one <laughs> at each table, and then for four minutes perform this exercise at your table. You have the instructions, use this as the ball. One paper per table. You get four minutes. So hopefully you have a new friend or two at your table and you've also discovered that maybe other people have similar experiences. This is not an easy topic. It's learning to see value, especially in developing organizations that develop products or solutions, it's very hard. I worked with it myself, and by the name, my name is Carl Starendal. That's my full name and I'm from the other city at the other coast. Uh, that's where I live in my daily life. And I go here to visit my friends and to learn from you, of course, or to talk through a microphone about my experiences. And I worked with value stream identification out in the wild, both in Sweden and internationally. And I've done it in cyber physical systems builders and software houses, and it's never easy. It's always been one of the hardest things to do. I've been fortunate enough to, to learn from those experiences, and that's why I'm here to share today. And uh, the reason I got that broad exposure to those things was mainly because I, for a couple of years, worked for a company called Scale Agile that created the SAFE framework. And they sent me to places all over where I, well, helped organizations do this. My daily life today, when I don't travel anymore and live in Sweden, is to help people both learn about these ideas, applying lean and agile thinking, building systems and products, but also to be an advisor for people who try to do it, and then manifest the knowledge. Because this is really hard. This is tricky stuff. And we don't have all the, fun, the answers around this yet. This is still an emerging field. But tonight, we're going to talk about value streams and why they are valuable. No pun intended. And I think the best person to explain why this view of an organization, seeing value creation as a continuum, is valuable, is actually my friend, John Carter, I would like to call him my friend, but I, I don't know him. He's a very American guy from a, I've read his books and seen his videos, so I feel like I know him. Uh, he works with change management. He's a researcher at Harvard, and he's going to talk us through it. Hello, I'm John Carter, and I'm here to talk to you about winning in a faster and faster moving world. A world where more threats are coming at us from all kinds of different unpredictable directions, but also in which there are more windows of opportunity, opening and closing faster than ever. I am convinced that we've crossed a line in which the old methods that we've used to deal with this no longer work. And I want to talk to you briefly about what seems to work in this faster and faster moving world. 
To understand this, I found you need to understand how organizations naturally evolve over time and how that has gotten us to where we are now. All organizations start with a, a structure that kind of looks like a dynamic uh, solar system or a molecule. Their advantage of is that they can be very, very fast, uh, very agile. They can run around existing competition. They start with a um, set of entrepreneurs. It doesn't matter if they're trying to make a new type of microchip or a new type of chocolate chip cookie. They attract people who work on various initiatives. It could be anything. Uh, playing around with crazy ideas, talking to customers, uh, doing things with alloys. Um, and they can drop those initiatives and start new ones. If they're successful, though, they have to be able to make and ship a product or deliver a service. And as soon as that happens, you start to see growing something that we would recognize. It looks more like a hierarchy. It has jobs. It has processes. And if they continue to be successful, of course, it's that part that has to grow. And it grows. And for a brief time, you've got both both systems that tend to be hooked together well uh, because of the entrepreneurs who play a part in both. Uh, and sometimes the old timers that have jobs over at one side and they're still in that entrepreneurial system. But as successful as they are, you know what part grows and it grows. And at a certain point, it doesn't like the old entrepreneurial, unpredictable, whipping around system. And so it systematically eliminates it and you end up with what we all know, a typical modern organization. Now, in a slow enough moving world, uh, that can work fine, and it does. But as the world starts to speed up, it doesn't. And so what smart people do is they augment it. They add uh, strategic planning committees. They hire strategic consultants. They put together interdepartmental task forces or project management organizations to first create and then to execute strategies. And if this is done well, it works up to a point. But as the world speeds up more and more, it doesn't. So they continue along this same path. It happens naturally. You add another committee. You add work streams. You add more strategy pieces. And after a while, all of this addition, addition, addition actually slows you down, and the whole thing starts to sink into the muck, which obviously does not win today. It raises the question of what could win today, and actually, you just saw it a minute ago. Now, let's rewind the tape. Okay, start there and go back. Go back some more. Now stop. There it is. Something that can be reliable and efficient now and can be fast and agile in helping you maneuver through this faster moving environment. It creates more wealth, better products and services, a terrific place to work, and perhaps mo most importantly, profitable growth. That raises the logical question of can you create that and get those results? And the answer is yes, we've proven it. A set of processes and procedures and methods can take you from wherever you're at and you start growing that entrepreneurial piece from the center on out in an organic way. You keep the two pieces connected in a very solid way and you end up with this mechanism that can be both uh, reliable, efficient, fast, and agile and win today. Here's the bad news. How many organizations have succeeded in doing that? About 0.001%. Really, seriously. Here's the good news. It doesn't have to be that way. It doesn't. 
you can change, you can create what's needed, and when is the time to do that? No question. It's now. So, if you want to learn more, go here, and let's get on with it right now. So that's John Carter. He's extremely American, uh, and he's got this very forceful and direct way of talking to people. It's kind of his style. His, his core, the core of his point here is that there is, there is a need to unlock entrepreneurship in organizations, to help people work closer to a problem, to, to innovate, to be f fast and flexible, but still not throw out the baby with the bathwater. We still need to have an organization. There's probably going to be a budget. I think there's probably going to be a CEO and a, probably a CFO somewhere also, yes. What he's talking about, in my view, is seeing value again, because it's already happening. And then letting that be a paradigm for how we organize the development work. Here is where we develop new value. He doesn't call out directly the value stream, but in his thinking, I can see this coming out. So doing that, allowing this to be the paradigm for how we organize our development work, the stream, not the departments or the reporting lines, what's the benefits of doing that? Well, what I've seen is that it's, it's, there's a simple metaphor for it. it. This comes from Henrik Kneeberg, another agile coach from Stockholm. And he says, it's easy, Carl. You just focus on your products instead of your projects, because your projects, your customer doesn't care. They buy your products. And the products are going to be there for the years to come. The projects will come and go. It's kind of the same way of thinking. But the benefits is simple things. What I've seen is that when we do that, shorter lead time is a benefit mainly through shorter handoffs. If we allow the paradigm of the continuum, the value stream, to be where we also sit, where we also think, where we also work, we shorten handoffs. Basically making sure that that line of communication for working together, together is shorter. This makes sure that we get faster feedback. When we start developing something over here, the time until it's done over here shortens if we allow that paradigm to be how we see, work, and organize. Faster feedback. Shorter lead time, more flexibility. Another one that comes out of doing it has been that quality shifts. And I, quality is a often poorly understood word. Quality doesn't mean that the steering wheel of the car is uh, bug free or that that component in your software is bug free. Quality in the end means that it solves the customer's problem in a satisfying manner, in a good way. All other things are basically proxies. And when we don't have the value stream as the the construct to see, it means that we instead view inwards, we see our own work. Here I have quality where I work. Well, does that actually change how this person over here that drives the car, that operates the software, that does their taxes, is it smooth and effective for them? So by organizing around that, we can shift everyone's gaze, everyone in the value stream, to look up. Oh, that person over there. That's the one we work for. So I need to understand my work from a quality perspective from that person's eyes. It means that when we say customer quality, it's not some buzzword. It's literally, well, that's the person at the end of our value stream. We've met him. He's a great guy. And he has some serious things that we're trying to help him perform. So it shifts the quality aspect now to mean something that actually can impact your business or your customers. The third thing is that technology talking systems building here, building big complex systems, and the business perspectives can easier align. You can't go either way, you need both. Technology in itself enables the business, the business in itself enables us to build awesome technology that solves a real customer problem. These two paradigms, these two worlds need to meet. The best way to interface is, in my experience, through organizing around the value creation, not the activities, because now suddenly, here, at the end of the value stream, that's where business and technology meets properly. We have the same goal now. We don't have one over here where we build technology saying, I want to build this awesome component, the best component ever made. Now we can instead say, from a business perspective, we need this type of component. And from a technology perspective, if that's the business challenge, then this is the way to build it smart and effective. So we can align between business and technology. So this thinking of organizing development work around the value stream is not new. It comes mainly from this book and this guy. This is Alan Ward. 
Um, anyone read this one? Yeah. If you haven't, go read it. It's a, it's a thick one. It's a bit dense. But the thinking around applying lean ideas for product development, not for only for manufacturing, he was early in his thinking. And this, the nice thing about this book, doesn't have one mention of software in it. This is completely in the domain of hardware products or firmware products. So it doesn't really reference building software in that sense. So this is where the thinking comes from. So I want to start out with a small case with organizing around value. And on your chairs, you have a small article, looks like this. And what, I, what I'm going to ask you to do is to individually read this one. It's about how Instagram grew and how they reacted to that growth by thinking about value creation from a different standpoint. And I want you to read it, and in 10 minutes, make sure you've also discussed these three questions at your table. What was the driver behind, behind the reorganization? What was the first thing they did? And also, what's the trade-off with the new type of organization? So read the article, and then discuss these three questions at your table. And then we'll find the answers together in 10 minutes. Okay, most of you got through the article, and maybe you have some answers. So I want to ask uh, the audience here, what's the, for the first one, what's, what's the driver behind the reorg? Why, why did they start doing this? Anyone want to give it a go? What's the answer? Yeah, they were getting bigger and still wanted to be effective. So they understood that how we organize around what we do is an, will have impact. <laughs> That's the key driver behind it. What's the first thing they did? Did they just start moving, moving chairs around or what's the first thing they did? They did something very important. They were looking for what is important for us. What outcomes are we looking for? You go, we're not trying to reorganize to have the chairs smoother or better. We're looking for specific outcomes, meaning that the new way of looking at value creation should achieve those outcomes. That, and that, that is critical, because if you don't, how can you judge between option A and B? The, both options are going to be, yeah, I like B because I get a corner office, so I'll choose that one. Literally, it's completely arbitrary, but if you have outcomes that you've established beforehand, now you can choose. So that's a key thing they did. And the new organization they chose, what's the trade-off here? Was it just plain awesome? Or was, there, was, there, was there anything, that they, an ability they lost or something that became harder or more complex or more expensive? Did you see anything in the article? Speed over duplication. So what's the cost? What's, it, what's the duplication, right? They specifically call out that, well, if we're going to do this, then we have to duplicate code. And you're not allowed to do that, are you, right? That's forbidden. That's a bad idea, right? Sorry? That's a bad idea. That's a bad idea, right. <laughs> exactly. So traditionally, we would say, but that's just stupid, because that's, that will cost us more. But you said also speed, because they, they do that. They take that cost, because actually, Duplicating the search functions in both sort of value streams, they don't call it that here, but that has this cost, but being slow in the market delivering new features has this cost. So th there's always going to be a trade-off. And this is why it's so critical to understand what you're optimizing for before you even start with value stream identification, because there's going to be options, option A, option B, option C. In development work, the value streams are often nested, or sometimes even networked. They can be very hard. So you need to understand and decide also what's the value stream that we want to propagate here. So this article has actually been quite valuable for me when talking about it, even though it doesn't really call out value streams at all. It's from Harvard Business Review from like a year ago or so. Uh, it's a good one to use when you're trying to explain the concept. But then we're at the SAFE meetup, so I don't think it's fair to talk without uh, showing the big picture at least once, right? You have to show it. Uh, we, we, everyone's seen this one. It's the lean and agile uh, view from the scaling agile framework. And this one actually has value streams in it. They're not easy to see always, but they're up here. It even says value streams there. Easy to miss. 
each art here, Agile or Lease Train, a team of teams, always works inside an established value stream. And the purpose of this portfolio here is to govern and make sure that these value streams are effective. I call it the blue stuff in SAFE, because they're blue, actually blue in the picture here. And that's the value streams in SAFE. And how they think about the Scaling Agile framework, think about them, is really elegant. Because it's traditionally when we develop features, uh, solutions, products, is that we often have a line organization. This is the more common dogma in the world. You have organized into either functional silos or they could be uh, maintenance pools. You could organize around components in your organization. You have basically one part of the organization that maintains the systems and solutions that you already have. And then on top of that, you run projects. Short-lived bursts of activity where you allocate resources, sorry humans, to basically short-lived initiatives that drive new features that cut across maintenance pools, competencies or components or whatever they are. And th this is the more common dogma in the world. And actually my mentor, Dean, he always joked with me about these projects. He said, so Carl, why do we have project managers? And since it's a, you're not really allowed to have them in Agile, I said, I don't know. I said, it goes, to force value to move across the silos. It's hard work, man. He was always like, they're the heroes because they actually, they push and pull the features to move. Because the, the natural line organization resists this change because they're already fully booked. So this, this, this is not a bad way to organize, but it is slow. It is cumbersome. The way SAFE does it instead is that we take the value stream as the paradigm, and then we allow a network of teams that work together to build something, the value in the stream, to take needs and fulfill those. Meaning that maintenance and new development happens in the same value stream. It means that the people who create new value also maintains what you already built. It means that you have ownership of what you build. It means that you can see the value. And this becomes the paradigm that we organize around. So just some notions of this from a safe perspective. Anyone ever heard the word agile release train? Yeah, a couple of you. It's basically what SAFE calls a team of agile teams that work together. And the idea here, just to be super clear, is that this construct always lives inside an established value stream. It's not a, we got all the teams together at the company and had a PI planning. Like, no. They, what's the value stream? Do they deliver to a customer together? Do they have a, a clear product or service that they go to market with? The underlying value stream is the construct that allow the Agile release stream to be effective, where we can optimize. And also, something we're going to talk about tonight, very big value streams. They are scary. They exist. Some solutions that are built in this world are very big. And they are hard to break up into smaller value streams. Take the example of building a fighter jet, American example, the F-22 jet fighter. They use Lean and Agile to build it. And if you go to market with F-22 Raptor, you don't do it with just a helmet because you need the full fighter. So you go to market with the full solution. So the value stream is the F-22 Raptor, hardware, firmware, software, the whole thing. It's not one art. It's multiple arts that work together to, to realize that large solution. Large value streams are hard because you introduce a lot of coupling. They're hard to manage. We'll talk more about it, but SAFE allows you to basically fulfill a large value stream if needed. And the value streams from a SAFE perspective is also the constructs that we fund. So the ability to build is where we allocate the money to. And that ability is directed towards these opportunities, these solutions or products or service that, that we provide. So this is also how you close the loop on the funding and the governance. They're a central construct in the Scaling Agile framework. It's the fundament that we organize around. So what about value streams then? How do they look? Well, they always start with a need. And they always have multiple activities in my mind. It's, I've never seen one which is just one activity. And somewhere, there is someone who provides value to the organization even, meaning that we have a purpose. If you're, if you're a money-making machine, this is selling something. If you're a service-providing government agency, this is a happy, this is a smiling citizen saying, my taxes are well spent. 
Like when I did my tax return with the, the Mobile Bank idea, I smile every time. I literally feel like this is, this is my government. That, that's a probably a value stream, I don't know, it could be. And the trick is that there's often tons of people involved in performing these activities. And we call this whole construct the operational value stream, meaning that this is the purpose that the organization has. In a smaller organization, these can be sort of easy to see because you see people moving, you see customers coming in, oh, they buy the cloud solution, oh, they buy the, the umbrellas. That's providing that's the operational value stream. However, in a bigger organization, these can be hard to see, even these ones, because you're so big. Multinational corporations. Here's another example, the big one. You're a <coughs> oh, sorry. What the questions we ask to see them are, for example, how does the external customer describe or perceive what they receive and the flow going there? Basically taking the reverse storytelling angle, not starting with uh, like the Lord of the Rings. They, there's a big boring party at the first book and then they meet the wizard and so on. You go the other way around. You start with, yeah, and then the, the ring was thrown into the volcano. Just before that though, Frodo has been wrestling with Gollum. And just before that, so you go from outside in to see them. Another trick is to ask the simple question, I say. What products, systems, services, or applications, or solutions do we sell? How do we make money? Like, what's the, what's the, I can sometimes visit the website and just look. Oh, they have a cloud solution, an on-prem, cool, two value streams. Often that. Or, if you're really big, what key, businesses, uh, key business processes are enabled? I've seen some really big operational value stream where that becomes a key question. So some examples, and oh, here's an emergency room. This is an important company that provides care. The, the trigger is that, well, you have a broken arm. The, the value is that, well, it's in a cast and I'm, I'm okay. And then in that there's tons of people, people that can take you into the hospital, triage how sick are you, they treat you, they, you're, they're in the hospital, they do rounds, and if you're in the US, they charge you, That's a very, not in Sweden. I don't think so. This is for free. But the, this, is, this can be hundreds or thousands of people. And thinking about lean and agile systems building, do you think they use systems doing this work? Yeah. There's probably gazillion amounts of software and hardware machines involved in this one. Another little bit simpler one, take a software company. This is one where actually the development work and the, the market needs, so to speak, go together. Imagine that you have a cloud service. This is a, actually a company I worked with and an on-prem service. It's basically the same solution, but provided to two different customer segments that have a little bit different needs, but it's the same solution. This is your operational value streams. Another one, this is also from a real case from where I worked, where you have a retail value stream, and this is global. So we have a need for a new collection of clothes, and here, over here, it's actually been sold. So this is a big one. I think maybe 100,000 people involved here, so 12 countries, something like that. Someone has to design next year's clothes, someone has to procure, talk to suppliers, someone has to produce, they have to be shipped all around the world, they have to be in, uh, in some storage uh, all around the world, and there's also, it's being sold in the stores. Again. They use a lot of systems to do this. They can't do this. They can't perform this operational value stream in 2019 without smart systems. And the emergency room then, let's think about that. If this is the operational value stream, how, how do we organize our systems building capability from a, from a value stream perspective here? Imagine that there's hundred different solutions. There's an MR machine, MRI machine, there's a Maybe over here, there is a, when you come to the hospital, there's someone with an iPad, and there's like a like system where you maybe log the patient to go, yeah, he's not bleeding, check, he's still alive, check, uh, he's got insurance, check, and so on, and that gets stored somewhere. Probably a very complex solution. So maybe here, there is a, like in the Instagram example, there is something flowing from the other angle. These are basically new needs for that solution. And maybe here's the MRI machine. There's actually a team in, in Sweden building a, a gamma ray machine where you treat uh, cancers in your brain with gamma rays using lean and agile. And that 
is a long-lived solution that is provided to the customers here, which is the people who actually use that machine to treat people. And maybe over here is the billing system in the US where you charge your customers a lot of money for treatment. And this is an important thing because this is what I call development value streams. And this is the blue stuff in SAFE. So the thing we organize around using the Scaling Agile framework is the development value streams. Those are the blue things. They might be the same as the development value streams, specifically if you are going to market with the systems or solutions that you're providing. But if you are not providing systems and complex systems products to your customers, you do it to someone who helps the customers, then you need to reason about what are the development value streams. That's the thing we organize around using SAFE. So, the key thing here, and this is one that can go very wrong unless you're careful, is that if you want to identify development value streams, you need to first identify and understand the operational value stream. You can't go the other way around. I've seen people do that. They draw a, a development value stream around the department and say, here's a development value stream. The BI department is a development value stream. Cool. I go, uh, how, do, how, 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 how are you thinking? I go, well, it's a very important thing for us. Yes, I understand. What's the operational value stream they serve? And I go, we don't know. We just felt it was convenient to keep our old mental models intact. I'm like, no, 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 no. <laughs> Always start with the operational value stream before you go to development value streams. So this is the point where I'm going to give you not coffee, but wine. So uh, we're at the meetup. So I'm going to challenge you to be a bit brave here. So find two or three people, maybe uh, just groups of two if you can, and someone from another table that you've never seen before, literally is someone you don't even know the name of. And together with that person, move to the other room, get a wrap, get some wine, and discuss these three questions. In your mind, when are development value streams and operational value streams the same? Have you seen such a case? Also, in your organization, what are the operational value streams and what could be potential development value streams? Are they aligned? Are they orthogonal? Are they the same? What could be the case? So stand up, find a friend, a new one, be brave. This is a meetup after all, and I'll see you in 10 minutes. So we've had some wine and some wraps, and we've been trying to wrap our head around the notion of operational and development value streams that can be the same, specifically if you're going to market with what you're selling, they might overlap, but the development value stream concept might also be aligned with long-lived services or solutions that help the operational value stream. The purpose here is the operational value stream. That is why the company exists. I mean, the operational value stream is how we go to our customer in the end, our end customer. But we need to reason about who it, that is, the, the, the person we provide the, the market value to or the end value to, in order to understand how to meaningfully organize our systems building capability. That's the key learning here. So I want to dive into the practice of actually running identifications like this. I've done it multiple times and let me be honest, it's, this is full of razor blades. I've hurt myself a couple of times doing it. It's extremely complex and extremely hard. And uh, I just want to share some mistakes around this. But before that, who in here have run a value stream identification workshop? A few of you, yes. Anyone who's used this one from the Scaling Agile framework? A few of you, yes. Uh, I'm going to reference a little bit from this. Uh, and if you're, if you're a certified safe SPC, one of the trainers, this is a free kind of toolkit that they give you, that you have access to. I've used it multiple times myself. It has some pros and some cons. It's a good tool to get started with, at least. And of course, if you don't use that, you can just make your own identification workshop, mainly based on the content, contents in this presentation and online, of course, also. But the basic pattern I'll show you <clears throat> has some, some, I've learned a few things from doing it. So here's three very bad things I've done before running such a workshop. 
things that I wouldn't recommend you to do. One thing I've done once, and I won't never, will never do it again, is that I didn't really train people in the concepts of lean and agile thinking before the workshop. It was hard. We had a few people who uh, kind of were acquainted with the concept of value streams and, and throughput and working in smaller teams, product discovery, all that good stuff. And some people who didn't, never heard of it. And the entire workshop was ruined by them saying, what project is this? It was the only question that came up all the time. The mental model uh, was, there's nothing wrong with that question, but it, it's simply the wrong question in that form. So you, my experience is that I need to shift thinking a little bit before. So make sure that people are trained. It doesn't have to be something specific, but just the thinking around thinking in lean and agile terms before entering the room. Otherwise, the, it's such a paradigm shift. So it's not nice to people. And it, that workshop didn't produce any results. Next one is one where I did a very long value stream identification. We ran it. It went on for weeks. Weeks turned into months. Of course, this was an on and off thing. We weren't in the same room all the time. And what we were doing was trying to find the single right answer. Very, very unagile approach, I would argue. It didn't work. The only thing that came out was that we became angry at each other because everything was just down to, I like this option better than this. So we never got to the point where we tried something. So the learning here is not to run it as a full upfront solution. You do lightweight identification multiple times. What you're doing is that you're learning to see. And it's a new skill, so you need to build muscle around it. You don't do all the gymnastics at the actual Olympics. You train before that. So by doing it in multiple steps, multiple times, you help people learn the new seeing skills. And another one, very bad, was that we didn't identify the outcomes before the workshop. Very bad. Just like what Instagram did here. We skipped that. So option B was not better than option A. It was just down to, to pet peeves and preference. So we, we knew that value streams were important. But since there were so many options around development value stream design, we never got anywhere. So some tips before the workshop. Well, the first one is to do that. Align on the organizational outcomes. It can be simple things. In the Instagram article, they have something that's, I don't think these are super awesome, but for example, um, clear measures, uh, roadmaps for, uh, for, clear roadmaps for product lines. It's okay. okay, it's not super outcome based, but it's something at least. I've seen things where we go in and they say, okay, Carl, whatever option we choose, we need to cut new product delivery time in half. Otherwise, we won't survive as a company in five to 10 years. I'm like, cool. Now, that's going to give us some, some options to choose between. That's a very powerful one. Or where, where they've said customer quality, perceived customer quality on the solutions we provide in the market needs to go up drastically. OK, cool. That's a good one. So whatever the outcomes are, make sure they are established. The second thing, define who participates. You can't do this with engineers only or business people only. Often it's a clear mix or big mix of uh, enterprise architects, uh, business architects, business people, engineers. You'll have a broad range of people, 10 to 20 people in the room. And then make sure they're trained. Make sure they have some training. I tend to use like a standard safe training or a standard lean training, something like that. Or I could make my own one day thing just to acquaint everyone with the lens and the mental models before the workshop. And then, and this is a break from the safe workshop because this is a big pitfall in that one. Literally, you do it in sort of one day in the safe uh, workshop where you go in and then the first exercise is Draw the operational value stream on the wall, 10 minutes. Next step, I'm like, whoa, 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 whoa. That first one is a big thing. I've failed multiple times with that. So my learning here is that before going into the identification actually workshop, I work with the people who's going to be there and try to discover some operational value stream that we'll be working with. So we have a rough understanding of them before going into the room. In a smaller company, this could work to do in the room at the start. In a big one, multinational, multiple product lines, 
multiple services or solutions, mm, do it before is my recommendation. And when you're running the identification, it tends to look sort of like this. I might not have 100 people, but maybe 20 or 30. Good mix across the organization. Everyone is trained. We have a few operational value streams we've discovered before. And then we run it in parallel. So we have multiple teams exploring the same value streams, basically looking for options. This is more akin to archaeology. We're trying to discover how value is moving through our organization and finding options for how to direct it towards our customers. The first step for me is always to map out, have each team map out the operational value stream they're working with. Tend to do need, the trigger, and then the, the uh, end customer value delivery, and then work inwards from both ends or from one end to the other, mapping out what activities does the organization take. Is it sales in one end and then marketing, sales, building the solution? What is it? Is it the, the, hosp the hospital intake? Is it treatment? Is it discharge? And then also defining who are the humans that actually do this operational work? Is it accountants? Is it developers? Who are it? Who are the people who have performed these activities? And then from that, we need to start exploring Conway's law inside this value stream. And Conway's law is an interesting concept. It's basically someone observing systems and systems being built by humans and saying that, a guy called Conway, of course, said that, I can see your org chart in your code. <laughs> Literally, the, the systems built by people tend to reflect the dynamics of the social system that created the systems. Many times when I've done this, I could easily, I'll show you the map in a moment, I could easily sometimes see, here's a budget, here's a budget, here's a budget, by looking at the, the, the architecture. And they go, well, how do you see that? Well, I go, well, you've duplicated the same functionality over here, <laughs> over here, over here. You have someone who have clout. Well, I've seen stuff like, your animation department hates your sound department. You go, well, how do you know? They're like, well, it's two very big blobs of code. There's a shitty API in between that no one takes care of. I can see that in your code. So you can't ignore neither the technical architectural aspects of this or the social aspects. You need to map both. So what you do after you've mapped out the operational value stream is that then, uh, then ask each team to start digging. What components, what systems, what parts, what solutions are being used to provide this operational value? So if, you're in a, if this is the hospital intake, this might be the system that we use or the group of systems that are being used to, to make sure we can take in a patient and log them. And then thinking about what components, what parts of the architecture are being consumed by these operational activities and how are they interconnected? And now you're starting to see the implications of Conway law pop out here. You're creating a, a map. And finding perfect knowledge here is not always doable in an identification workshop. You're looking for a rough map of how the architecture is coupled with the social system. Because the next thing you do is map out who actually builds these things, who takes care of these components, of these parts, of these parts of the architecture, this part, these systems. Where are they in the world? How many are they? And now you, the implications of Conway's law will soon re reveal themselves if you've if you got a keen eye for this. And you'll see old decisions in here, old thinking. Decisions taken 10 years ago around departments or budgets or things that you didn't think impacted the system architecture that does. Once you've built this map, now it is time to start thinking. And you'll have <coughs> multiple teams in the room, multiple tables, each building their own map. They tend to be sort of the same, but you might also find interesting nuances in them. But then, the next step is to start thinking about how would we segment this into development value streams? What things do we want to fund? A, a good question to ask is sometimes like, what systems or what, what parts of your architecture is impacted by the upcoming requirements? Where do they hit? Well, you have here is where new needs hit, and they hit across this boundary. Maybe this is the hospital intake, so this is the systems and solutions that take in the patient and make sure they can exist in our system. 
And here, we have a huge new need for new development, new feature, new functionality to enable this operational work. So this could be a development value stream. And then you go, oh, okay, maybe there's one over here, and then there's a reasoning behind that. The, the questions you ask here are things like, what uh, long-term organizational abilities do we support? What solutions do we provide to the operational value stream? Where do we need clear roadmaps? Where do we need a vision for what we're building? What do we steer towards? Remember that we're also funding the development value streams if we're using a thinking inside the scaling agile framework specifically. So you need to think about what do we fund? And where's the trigger? What, what our upcoming needs, where do they hit? And where's the value delivery? And the tricky part is that there is no right option here. You will discover a multitude of options. So often the technical architecture and the social infrastructure is tightly coupled, more so than it should be. And you need to reason about how to organize around that with the given constraints. So you'll find one option looking like this. You'll have another table saying, oh, it's like this, because X. And you'll have another table saying, oh, we should have it like this, because X. Uh, and then you need to triage. I tend to get a long list of options from each table. We'll put together a flat list of the different designs for the operational value stream. And then we'll do a, 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 a ranking in the room. So this, just taking how, what things do we consider? Like we want few dependencies, lightweight coordination. Are we achieving the strategic outcomes and what's the impact of this change organizing around the development value stream like this? And then we just ask people in the room, we use the crowd wisdom approach here. Just rate it. How well does it achieve X? And from that, aggregate. You'll get a flat list of one or two options on top. That seems to be the best way to start. And again, don't overthink here. Don't, do like, don't be like me. Don't spend weeks doing this. Spend a day, build muscle, do some lightweight identification, find a first development value stream that looks like here could be a good place to start. This part. The people who provide the solutions to the intake or the people who provide this product line with, with the the cyber physical system, the new plane or something like that. That's where we could start exploring. <coughs> and the next thing you need to do is to start thinking about how to manifest this into work. Ma mainly making sure we have teams and arts or tribes or whatever you want to call them organized in these value streams. And this is again another game. Options again. There's no one right answer. If the development value stream is big, you might even have multiple arts in it. So again, you'll take the development value streams. Maybe this is your option, the, the best option. From the quick ranking you did, this came up on, on top as a potential design for how to organize around development value streams to enable this operational value stream. Okay, well, now you need to think, how do we segment this into the agile release trains? The, nest of teams in SAFE that delivers the value, that actually do the work inside these development value streams. Now, there's some questions to ask. How do we build them so they're not too big? We've discussed this many times. Many of you are trained, lean, and agile thinkers. Human brain is not built for mass-scale collaboration. We're very good at collaborating in smaller groups. So we tend to keep these no bigger than 125. I've seen maybe 150. 10 teams, something like that, that can have a purpose together and do something together. Holistic systems, make sure the Agile release train inside the development value stream has somewhere to go with something. Do they provide one part of the development value stream, one part of the system or solution? Long live holistic goal, if possible. And where can we have long live stable teams that work together consistently and continuously de delivering value inside the art? And how do we minimize the interconnectivity, the dependencies with the other arts? This is to help facilitate the quality thinking in there and the speedy delivery. And can we release independently of other arts? Can we actually go through one agile release train in this value stream with a new feature to our subset of the solution or our part of the product without interconnecting with other arts? These are the questions I would ask. And then the game starts anew. Each team in the room, we have our options, we segment it into multiple art options, and then we rate. What, how would we 
treat this? From how would upcoming new initiatives impact? Would that help us fl flood the things through? What would minimize dependencies and coordination? What's the organizational impact of having this development value stream having two arts like this? You might consider organizational boundaries, geographical boundaries, technical boundaries. And then you pick one and go. By now, you've, during one day, you've found one operational value stream. Seemed like it. Let's start here. You've identified a first really smart development value stream here that seems like the best place to start. Inside that, you've found one agile release train that you're going to start with. That's where you start. And then you try. And you're going to discover, in my experience quite often, that this isn't the right one. It's a little bit to the left. And then you need to shift. Don't overthink. Go for one fast. And then when you've done this for a while, you go back, revisit the workshop for the next development value stream, build more muscle, do it again and again and again. You don't get, get good at doing this the first time. The organization doesn't. It needs to repeat it. So before moving further, I want you to just try this once. I have brought a bank case for you. It's a very abstract small case. It's nice because they don't sell the software they're building or the systems they build. They actually provide other services. So I have this on your table. And I want you, what I want you to do is to, together with your table, I want you to take this and I want you to think about how would you segment this one into two different options for development value streams. So you have option one and option two on either side of the paper. So could it be one big development value stream? Could it be three small? Why would they be like that? And the constraints that you need to consider are the following. The idea for long term is that the core banking systems is to be actually accessible by others as a service. So there's a big cluster of systems at the end of the value stream. And those systems, the idea is to provide those as a separate operational value stream in the future. So that's a future concern. And the goal thereafter is to shorten lead time in feature delivery through each value stream and then shift the focus from internal quality to actually customer quality. The people who consume the services. What do they feel about it? So you get, get 10 minutes, do two, the two options, two different value stream designs for development value streams with the existing constraints. Work with your table. Good luck. So of course you've solved this now. You found the wrong, one right option, right? Yep, this is super simple. Yep. Uh, I'll show you kind of how I would think about this. Uh, I would probably say that this is, it's, it is basically an unsolvable problem. There's no one right solution. If you have this, you have to think in options. You're going to have multiple options and then think about which one could be the best one from these constraints or these outcomes that we're looking for. You could say, for example, that this part, this is where we meet the bank customer. This is up until the trigger point where we actually take a decision about can we afford to have them as a customer. It's the, what's the risk on this, basically? It's making sure they have a channel to meet us in, we can kind of put, put them in our systems, and then we can score them. That could be a development value stream. And maybe this one, like I stated there, there's a constraint saying that we're hoping to this, so this can serve or be its own operational value stream also in the future. Maybe it's smart to fund that separately, have this to be its own development value stream from the start. Tr trick here is though that, well, these, the, with the existing architecture and the existing setup of the operational value streams, there's going to be some coupling here, a lot of it. I mean, most of these can't work without them doing some work. So if you're doing this, your next job is to decouple here. Make sure you have soft APIs, turning this into a more of a consumable thing rather than a big ball of COBOL code, which it probably is today. Another option might be to just do, okay, let's say it's a one big development value stream. This is all about loans. Done. Everyone in here is doing loans, like loan customers. We love loan customers. Uh, okay, that's a good option, but do you think th this part is used by other systems in the bank? Yeah, probably the entire bank, right? So you have a different trade-off. Yeah, you've seen that one. 
So what you do here is that you basically look for options. I'll design multiple. I'll let the, the groups in the room provide multiple development value stream options and then pick one. So I'll challenge you to take this one, saying that we want one big one. How would you segment that into arts? Say that you have the entire thing as a development value stream for some obscure reason. How would you segment that into arts? Given these constraints, shouldn't be that big preferably have some kind of holistic product or service they provide, fewer dependencies with other arts, yeah. Try it on, how would you design that? Draw on the paper, talk about the solution. You get like seven minutes maybe? So if you spent a few minutes reasoning about how to organize a bigger value stream into multiple agile release streams. Again, the thinking is, a little bit similar to segmenting the operational value stream into the development value stream if needed, but here you have some different constraints. Some solutions that I would think about just top of my head would be things like, well, maybe this big one could be, here's one arc, again, like the first development value stream, up until the risk trigger, where we bring them in as a customer, and then this is now a separate agile release train. The, the trick here is that we fund the whole thing, though. This is the ability we're after. These are different working groups or working teams where we hope to release features and functionality sort of independent, but there's still going to be coupling, which is a challenge. Another one might be to have a smaller agile release train in Uppsala, north of Sweden here, where you have um, the channels. Basically, this is where we attract our customers. It's maybe mobile banking, it's maybe web, it's how we meet our customer. And then there's one over here that once the customers found us, we can take care of them and then we can bring them up until the point where we take a decision and then one over here. That could be another option. So conclusions here, you, you need to find options. There's going to be multiple options and trying to find the right one up front will hurt you because that will just bring up the cost of delay. You will never try. And when you first try to execute in your development value streams, you'll find that it needs to shift. And also, to be honest, do you think your development value stream definition might change in the future? Yeah. Do you think your operational value stream might change in the future? Yes. So what you're looking for is also the ability to then re-segment, rethink this. So maybe the channel focus is the thing today, but tomorrow our company is going to be all about risk. Well, now we need to shift that. So you're, you're building the muscles to learn to see so you can adapt as you go. That's also a benefit from doing this. And to, just to conclude the session tonight, some of my biggest mistakes and uh, how I try to fix them when doing this. I've been saying this all night, but it's important. I was trying to define all the development streams up front. Didn't work. Don't do that. Pick one, start, try, do the identification again, see with new eyes, try again, iterate, iterate, iterate. You will always pick the wrong option from the start and you need to shift. Second one, skip development value streams and just say, we're going to work with safe, so let's have some arts. Trains, everyone loves trains, right? And then just, what? And whenever people say that to me, we have an art. I go, that's cool. What's the value stream? And then they say, we don't know. And I go, watch out, because <laughs> you don't know what you're optimizing for. You often, often you have drawn an art around an old program or a department or an old mental model, and you will struggle. So don't do that. Work mainly with identifying the streams of value, starting with operational, going to develop and development, and then think about how do we have teams and awesome people here to enable these flows. That's the way to go. Third one, again, ran the workshop for the participants. This is a good one for the facilitators out there. They brought me in because they thought I was the expert, and the whole workshop was them looking at me saying, Carl, what's the answer? <laughs> like, but I don't know. You're the people who do the work. You've been here for 10 years. I haven't. But they, they had so kind eyes, so I stepped in and drew a value stream, and I felt awesome. <laughs> and then it was the wrong one. And Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't have context, you don't have context. Use the brains in the room. Allow them to find their answer. 
because this is also change management. It's about making sure that the humans involved in this have ownership of the shift. If you do this, as someone suggested, Carl, you should do big room value stream identification with like hundreds of people. Like, oh, uh, a bit scary, because these are big questions. But whatever you do, make sure to involve people and have them explore it. I have multiple times when I run this, have people have insights in the session about what value streams actually are. It's through doing that you build that muscle. And then a big one. The large solution is safe. Basically having a big development value stream with multiple arts is a very powerful construct. It can be used for good or for bad. Be very careful with it. I have been guilty of drawing a large value stream just because it didn't cross any organizational boundaries. You just say, this whole shebang is a large development value stream. Nice. And then we ended up with a big thing to manage. Don't do that. The large solution, the big development value stream is there to solve a specific problem. And that is when your develop, when your, <laughs> the solution you're providing is so big that you cannot go to market with just a part of it. Basically, where am I in this world? Here you go. Basically, you're, it's a car, it's a, it's a plane, it's something where you can't segment the solution into multiple ones. If you can, do that instead. If you find something that looks like a big development value stream, use the first rule of scaling Agile, which is don't. Break it up, descale it. There can be multiple independent things that can go to market if you think about it a, a lap or two. So don't do large solutions because you're afraid of breaking it up. Always ask, how can you make it smaller? And then we have uh, skipped measuring the outcomes. Don't do that. Start day one. We had outcomes, but when we've exited the workshop, we didn't measure it. We didn't know if we reached them. Make sure you measure it immediately. And finally, don't wait. Just find one and start and do it again. Accept the imperfection of starting, but don't accept the lack of early validation and learning. You will, you will find out when you start executing that there is constraints, it isn't perfect, then you adapt. But don't wait with that finding. Everything we've talked about tonight, almost everything beyond my <coughs> mistakes and my learnings, is available on the Scaling Agile Framework website in this article. This is the sort of the, it's called the roadmap for the implementation roadmap. And it has a very nice article around value stream identification here. If you click that, you can revisit much of what we've talked about tonight. And uh, if you're going to do this, I suggest also you read a little bit. The first book I mentioned before, Lean Product and Process Development. But then I also recommend this Project to Product by Mike Kirsten. It's a bit newer and it's more uh, software focused, I would argue. But it's also a good read. And then you have this classic, Learning to See. This isn't referencing development. It's a book from manufacturing. And it, it is a book basically about value stream mapping, but it, many of the concepts or the, the theory in here is still applicable. I think it's valuable. And if you have a friendly, safe SPC in your organization, maybe it's time to ask her to run the workshop. They have access to that toolkit. Just have them use my tips also maybe, and that's off you go. So uh, that's it for tonight, and best of luck out there. Thank you. Thank you.